When we think of Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John from the New Testament are likely the four that are most spoken of. They are after all included in the Bible and are deemed by believers to be the closest words we have to what a historical Jesus might have said. These four Gospels were the books that the Church agreed were authentic representations of Christ himself. And indeed, whilst other Gospels of characters who lived around Jesus' time have been submitted, none have ever been accepted, likely due to their lack of authenticity or the conflicting Gnostic ideas that many of the lost Gospels are riddled with. The Gospel of Mary is one such book, thought to be written sometime in the early 2nd century of the Common Era. Somehow, it remained unknown to us for over 1500 years, before it was found, almost by chance, in the late 19th century. Unfortunately, to say we have a complete gospel would be a gross exaggeration, for in actuality, only around 8 pages of the original gospel have survived. Several theories exist as to what happened to the other pages. They were lost, they were destroyed, they were hidden, they were moved by God, there's no shortage of ideas to explain what happened to the rest of the document. But even with these missing pages, we are still treated to a glimpse of an almost infant Christianity, one that provides us with a narrative that illustrates a more radical Jesus, one who valued spiritual knowledge and even denied the existence of sin. It also shows us a contrasting view of the woman in question, Mary Magdalene, painting her as more of a noble and deserving character and disassociating her from the popular idea of her being a prostitute. Instead, in just a few pages, the equality of women is established. Women in this example are just as entitled to glory as men, and may even be more privy to the word or visions of God. Women in the form of Mary are suddenly championed, allowing us to envision an almost romanticized version of traditional Christianity, one that may have arguably existed in some Gnostic traditions. Before we dive into the Gospel of Mary, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, Gemstone Legends. Gemstone Legends is an RPG game that allows you to engage in tactical conflict and embark on epic adventures. Solve puzzles with the game's brain-teasing puzzle mode, join others as you enlist in guild wars to fight powerful monsters, and recruit all kinds of beasts into your army, including dragons. Gemstone Legends is available to play for free on iOS and Android, and you can download it right now using my link in the description, or scanning the QR code on screen. You'll also receive an amazing starter pack. One thing I've enjoyed whilst playing Gemstone Legends is the amount of characters to choose from. Play from over 200 heroes that each have unique skills and powers that can really turn the tables in battles. The game is also highly rated on both operating systems, so be sure to check this one out. You can find me in-game under the nickname Legends of His. And whilst you're there, be sure to check out the community Discord. Download Gemstone Legends now for free on Android and iOS using my link in the description below, or scan the QR code on screen. By doing so, players can receive a starter pack worth $50, including 500,000 coins, 300 gems, 10 mana elixir, 10 healing elixir, and a 4 star hero in Anarchy. Use these resources to get you through the daily, weekly and monthly challenges that are constantly being updated into this exciting game. In 1896, German scholar Dr. Karl Reinhardt came into possession of a manuscript after purchasing it from an antiquities market in Cairo, Egypt. At first glance, the manuscript appeared to most certainly be an old document, but no one could know the significance of what Dr. Reinhardt then held in his hands. Truth be told, it was a 5th century papyrus codex written in Coptic, and amongst the scrolls of writing, one could find the then unknown works of the Act of Peter, Sophia of Jesus Christ, the Apocryphon of John, and the Gospel of Mary. Mystery has surrounded these sets of texts from the moment they were found. Where did they come from? Why did an antiquities dealer have them? Did he even know the value in what he held? Some propose ideas that the antiquities dealer had obtained it illegally, for he claimed that a peasant had sold it to him, who had found it by mere chance in a wall. Others believe it had been found in a graveyard in the city of Akmin, long forgotten about since the time of a much earlier and much different looking Christianity. Dr. Reinhardt brought this manuscript back to Berlin, where it would be dubbed as the Berlin Codex. 
but work on translating the actual text would prove to be more difficult than expected. For starters, translating text is no walk in the park anyway, but when you add in the fact that the Gospel of Mary itself was missing several pages, in fact, more than half the book is actually lost, then it's almost impossible to fully grasp the true essence of what the Gospel of Mary is all about. What happened to these pages? Some say they were destroyed by whoever had found the manuscript. Others say they were kept by the antiquities dealer, knowing he could sell them at a higher price. Some say these pages simply perished, almost like some divine hand had deleted them from the world as they succumbed to age and ruin. The truth is, we will never really know. Publication of the few pages we do have of the lost gospel did go through some strange omens, almost like fate itself was trying to deny this very book from seeing the light of day. By 1912, Coptologist Carl Schmidt attempted to publish a translated version in Germany, but when the printer was distributing the pages, a water pipe burst and destroyed the entire copy. Schmidt attempted a second time to produce the work, but then World War I broke out, delaying the process even more until the conflict was over. By 1938, Schmidt attempted once more to resurrect the project, only to die that same year. So the burden fell to another scholar in Walter Till, who took up the project in 1941. But a final published edition wasn't released until 14 years later, in 1955. Alongside this, Greek fragments of the Gospel of Mary have also since been found in Egypt, one as early as 1917, although it was a fragment already contained within the Berlin Codex and another which was published as late as 1983. Despite this, we are still many pages short of a complete and coherent manuscript. Considering the Gospel starts from page 7, it opens abruptly with Jesus talking to his disciples, presumably after his resurrection. Then will matter be destroyed or not? An unnamed speaker asks, possibly Peter when we look at the structure of the conversation. Jesus, the Saviour, is then seen to reply, Every nature, every form, every creature exists in and with each other, but they will dissolve again into their own roots, because the nature of matter dissolves into its nature alone. Anyone who has ears to hear should hear. Here we can see Jesus answering questions about the end of what is the material world and the relative nature of sin. In this response specifically, he is telling Peter that everything that is, whether it be a man, or animal or plant is interwoven, whether spiritually or materially. In the end though, everything will become undone, and each man, each animal, each plant will return to its own original state, and or destiny. Potentially, what he means here is that though everything is connected, each individual spirit will be judged independently. Indeed, we might all be one, but our individual actions are our own. He continues, sin doesn't exist, but you're the ones who make sin when you act in accordance with the nature of adultery, which is called sin. That's why the good came among you, up to the things of every nature in order to restore it within its root. That's why you get sick and die, because you love what tricks you. Anyone who can understand should understand. Here Jesus suggests that sin isn't just a thing that's in the world. It's something we create when we act against our own interests and the interest of others. He states that people love what tricks them, which is tragedy, because what they love is what will lead them to death and destruction. He basically cautions his disciples here that they should be aware of where they place their energy and be cautious of what it is they desire, because not everything a person wants is necessarily good for them. He may also be referring to the more bodily passions here, considering he specifically mentions adultery, and that it is through discovering the true spiritual nature inside oneself is what will allow them to overcome temptation. He adds, Then confusion arises in the whole body. That's why I told you to be content at heart. If you are discontented, find contentment in the presence of various images of nature. Anyone who has ears to hear should hear. Once more, he stresses on the importance of knowing oneself, and of knowing oneself spiritually. He implies that it is only those who are discontent who will succumb to confusion, and that if one is content at heart, 
presumably only achievable via spiritual enlightenment, then they will overcome such confusions. He also provides some advice here to those who do not feel content, and that is to spend time in nature, to appreciate the natural things of the world, and find some sense of contentment in that. The Saviour concludes this teaching with a warning against those who would delude the disciples into following some heroic leader or a set of rules and laws. Instead they are to seek the child of true humanity within themselves and gain inward peace. After commissioning them to go forth and preach the gospel, the Saviour departs. He then supplies them with the last of his advice, explaining to them, Peace be with you, acquire my peace. Be careful not to let anyone mislead you by saying, look over here or look over there, because the Son of Humanity exists within you. Follow him. Those who seek him will find him. Once more, he encourages his disciples to look within themselves for the answers, for that is where the Saviour will be anyway, living inside of us. It echoes back to the Gnostic idea that everything is spiritually connected, as Jesus already specified here that if a person is connected to everything, then they are also connected to God, whether they realize it or not. He warns his disciples not to fall for people claiming to be God, and not to fall for the distractions of people knowing where God is, because as he explains here, God is within everyone, and only each individual person has the ability to find him on their own. After leaving them with this advice, Jesus basically drops the mic and pieces out. Go then, and preach the gospel about the kingdom. Don't lay down any rules beyond what I've given you, nor make a law like a lawgiver, lest you be bound to it. When he said these things, he left. Jesus is quite clear to his disciples that they shouldn't add anything to his words, nor take anything away, for this would not have been his true message. He also advises them not to make any laws from his words, perhaps wishing for people to come to these spiritual realizations organically. But it's also a precaution to the disciples that if they are going to make laws, they had better be prepared to live by them too. Just because they were his disciples then, it doesn't mean they were above anyone else. Yet despite Jesus' words, the disciples do not go out and start preaching the gospel as he intended. Instead, they start bickering and can't seem to agree on exactly what it was that Jesus had said. More pressingly, they express doubt, believing that if Jesus was crucified for such beliefs, then surely the same thing would happen to them. The Gospel tells us, But they grieved and wept bitterly. They said, How can we go up to the Gentiles to preach the Gospel about the Kingdom of the Son of Humanity? If they didn't spare him, why would they spare us? Mary proves to be the only disciple who has a grip on the situation. She attempts to mollify the other disciples, as we are told, Then Mary arose and greeted them all. She said to her brothers and sisters, Don't weep and grieve or let your hearts be divided, because his grace will be with you all and will protect you. Rather, we should praise his greatness because he prepared us and made us humans. When Mary said these things, she turned their hearts towards the good, and they started to debate the word of the Saviour. So yes, despite Mary stepping up in an effort to unite the disciples, who seem more lost now that Jesus has left, controversy is still sparked amongst them. They have not listened to what he had said about looking within to seek peace, and instead demonstrate something more akin to anxiety than anything else. Mary's suggestions here about not letting their hearts be divided, and to trust in Jesus because he had made them human, are probably the most aligned with what Jesus had previously been talking about. Basically, Mary is the only one who kinda gets it. Peter then turns to Mary and pretty much requests her to give her account of things, and to tell them anything that Jesus had once told her that might help them in better understanding him. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know the Saviour loved you more than all other women. Tell us the words of the Saviour that you remember, the things which you know that we don't, and which we haven't heard. In response, Mary said, I'll tell you what's hidden from you. So she started to tell them these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision and I said to him, Lord, I saw you in a vision today. In response, he said to me, You're blessed because you didn't waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is the treasure. 
I said to him, Lord, now does the one who sees the vision see it in the soul or in the spirit? In response, the Saviour said, they don't see it in the soul or in the spirit, but the mind, which exists between the two. So Mary basically tells Peter and the rest of the disciples here of what she had seen in her vision. She reveals that he had considered her blessed because she was not scared of him, and that indeed, this is where fear originates, in the mind. He declared that having a strong mind was the treasure, and so Mary aims to tell the others that it is the mind that is the most potent piece of equipment that man has, not the soul or the spirit. She adds that man does not see a vision from God with his spirit or his soul, but instead his mind, and that the mind exists between the two. Unfortunately, the text is broken beyond this point, and the next four pages are missing. We cannot know exactly what else Mary revealed to Peter and the disciples, but when we resume from what's available, we are thrown into what appears to be a story being told by Mary, in an effort to reveal what she knows. The story takes the form of seven powers of wrath. As we are told, the first form is darkness, the second desire, the third ignorance, the fourth zeal for death, the fifth the kingdom of the flesh, the sixth the foolish wisdom of flesh, the seventh the wisdom of anger. These are the seven powers of wrath. What these are exactly is not known to us, considering the breakings in the text but we do see these seven powers proceed to berate and argue with the soul, interrogating it at some points and accusing it in others. The soul appears to be calm enough to dismiss the words that the seven powers hurl at it, where it denies being wicked, denies being judged, and denies being a murderer. Mary seems to conclude that at the end of these conversations, the soul sheds the powers such as ignorance, desire, and death, and appears to conclude on a peaceful note, choosing to live in an age of silence. We are told, in response, the soul said, what binds me has been killed, what surrounds me has been overcome, my desire is gone, and ignorance has died. In a world, I was released from a world, and in a type from a type which is above, and from the chain of forgetfulness, which exists only for a time. From now on, I'll receive the rest of the time of the season of the age in silence. The text then tells us that after speaking these words, Mary fell silent, as in, she rested, just as the soul in her story did, because the Saviour had been speaking with her up to this point. Unlike the other disciples, Mary had reached within herself and found the Saviour, which enabled her to not only speak truthfully and organically, but also allowed her to connect with the Saviour and continue to deliver his message, even though he'd already disappeared in the physical sense. But seemingly irate over being upstaged by a woman, two of the disciples in Peter and Andrew attempt to challenge her, and object that the words she says make no sense. We are told, in response, Andrew said to the brothers and sisters, say what you will about what she said, I myself don't believe that the Saviour said these things because these teachings seem like different ideas. In response, Peter spoke out with the same concerns. He asked them concerning the Saviour, he didn't speak with a woman without our knowledge, and not publicly with us, did he? Will we turn around and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Andrew's response is a bit more diplomatic. He responds how any believer of modern Christianity might respond to hearing these ideas, in that they don't sound like the teachings from Jesus in the New Testament. He doesn't really attack Mary, but more so expresses doubt that these words are the words of the Saviour. Peter on the other hand takes it much more personally. Despite being the one to ask her to speak, it's possible that he wasn't expecting such an elaborate answer, and now felt upstaged by the whole thing, by a woman no less. He has a more emotional response than Andrew, choosing not to challenge the validity of the message but instead the validity of the messenger. He attempts to rally the others against her, asking them when would Jesus have ever spoken to her about these things, and almost seems to mock her when he asks if Jesus preferred her to them. Evidently, Peter appears to have missed the part about looking inwards, which is what Mary seems to have done, but because Peter is incapable of comprehending this, 
it's easier for him to reconcile that Mary is lying. So overwhelmed by Peter's outburst, Mary begins to cry. We are told, Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what are you thinking? Do you really think that I thought this up by myself, in my heart? Or that I am lying about the saviour? Peter isn't given a chance to respond, for it is Levi who speaks up next in defence of Mary, saying, Peter, you've always been angry. Now I see you debating with this woman like the adversaries. But if the saviour made her worthy, who are you then to reject her? Surely the saviour knows her very well. That's why he loved her more than us. Rather, we should be ashamed, clothe ourselves with perfect humanity, acquire it for ourselves as he instructed us, and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the saviour said. After these wise words from Levi, the disciples agreed to do as Jesus originally recommended, and go out to preach the gospel. This is where the story comes to a conclusion, but not much is actually resolved. You might say that just because Peter was admonished by Levi, it did not make him suddenly believe in what Mary was saying. In fact, it may have made him even bitter to have been publicly talked down to. The same can be said for Andrew, who had expressed himself fairly, and seemed much more set on the fact that he didn't believe Mary because of what she said, not because she was a woman. Ultimately, what we are left with is a bunch of disciples who go out to preach the word of the Saviour, but expose themselves as not having really understood it. To say the Gospel of Mary was banned may be a bit of a hyperbole. The truth is, considering when it was discovered, it probably wasn't ever really considered, especially when you look at its content. You see, the Gospel of Mary was written when Christianity was still in its infancy, and that Christianity looked a lot different from the one that's around today. Many of the Christian communities, some of which were Gnostic, were made up of very tiny amounts of people, and amongst these, some were even isolated, allowing them to kind of come up with whatever they wanted. There was no overarching church back then that approved or authorised a certain belief, and so it wasn't tremendously difficult for one to propose a new idea and for the local community to adopt it. As a result of so many early Christian communities, and partly because there was no one organised idea, various communities might have diverged in their perspectives and their beliefs. What we might consider as core Christian elements today might very well have been more flexible during this time, which is why texts like the Gospel of Mary and the Saviour who we meet here seem often like a far cry from the Jesus we know of today. It should also be remembered that back then there was no New Testament, and thus no single understanding of Jesus Christ which would explain why the Jesus seen in several of these banned Gospels differs so drastically. Still, understanding these books are of great benefit to believers and scholars alike, for they allow us to understand an early Christian period in a way that we're unlikely to ever achieve. We are treated to a diverse selection of ideas, motives and even characters, those who can appear so far removed from what we expect that one cannot help but be intrigued. By reading these texts, we can also see how modern Christianity has been shaped, how biblical characters have been perceived throughout the ages, and contemplate whether we're better off with what we have, or with what we've lost. Many thanks to Gemstone Legends for sponsoring this video. Be sure to check out the game using the link in the description, or scanning the on-screen QR code. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.